I'm Andy Burkowski here for Video Game Sophistry with Julian Cluck, filmmaker and proprietor of the site CleverNoob.com. How are you today, Julian? I'm great, Andy. How are you? I am. I've been doing better, let's put it that way. We've been fortunate to talk in the past, and today we are discussing the final film in your series of documentaries, providing criticism towards the game Mass Effect 3, specifically the extended cut DLC. Now, for those of us who are not familiar, can you tell us a little bit about your documentary? Uh, well, all three documentaries uh, aim to explain what the indoctrination theory is, and that is it's basically a fan-created um, sort of alternate ending for Bioware, the company that created Mass Effect 3, to fix the ending that so many fans have been displeased with, and they do that by saying that the main protagonist has been uh, what they call indoctrinated, which is a form of mind control uh, by the main antagonist of the series, and therefore the endings never actually took place, which gives Bioware a clean slate to redo the endings. And that's what the documentaries are about, and this last one is in particular about the extended cut uh, DLC that they released. Now, before we get more into the docs, your work in the project has literally exploded with close to a million people watching all of your series of documentaries. What has this journey been like for you? Oh, it's been pretty awesome. I mean, I never expected uh, any of this to take off as far as it did, honestly. I mean, talking to you guys in general has been a, a huge success to me to begin with. I never thought in a million years I'd get past 10,000 views on a single video, let alone you know, hundreds of thousands across all three of them. So... It's been very rewarding and very worth the time to put into it, and way more than I expected I would ever get from it. Overall, what has been the, how has it been received by fans, essentially? Have you gotten a lot of negative criticism, or have you found that your voice is akin to that of a lot of fans of, and critics of the series? Well, surprisingly, um, I guess I am sort of a, the voice for the, I mean, that sounds way too arrogant to say mm -hmm. like that. I, from what I've been reading, from what people have been telling me, um, you know, on the Bioware social network forums, I get referenced a lot, which is a surprise to me because uh, the theory itself was created from the mouths of the fans, and I'm just regurgitating most of that information. Um, but I guess that was the point of the documentary, to kind of put it all into one place so people can reference that. But um, I've received both positive and negative criticism, but overall it's been more or less astoundingly positive, believe it or not. Uh, but So I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Now, again, all of the information, all the videos, all the contact information will be available in the description of this video and, of course, within annotations in it. So if you ever get bored throughout and you want to see exactly what we're talking about, you don't want to get any spoilers, go ahead and click on that. You'll be forwarded to clevernoob.com in some cases, and you'll be able to see his documentary. Now, getting right into it, with the Extended Cut DLC, what is... In, within your documentary, the strongest point to, su to support the indoctrination theory? Well, uh, we, I think we talked about that way back in the first one, and I think it actually still stands even with the extended cut documentary because they were supposed to fill in a bunch of plot holes, and this is one of them that still has not been filled. And it's more of a personal opinion, but to me it's the fact that Shepard is still alive at the end of the Destroy ending. And... I mean, when you get hit with uh, the main pro or main antagonist's uh, main weapon, the Reapers, their laser, uh, everybody so far has been disintegrated. Like, there's no even chance of survival, so there's really no chance for him to survive at the end. And that is more of a recurring piece of evidence than it is something that was established with the extended cut DLC. But there's really just a whole slew of other things that were brought up, and it kind of you kind of need to go off on a snowball almost to fully understand why some of those other points are so important, which I address in the other documentary. So other people think there are other biggest main holy grail points, and for me it's the fact that Shepard is still alive. Absolutely. Now what is another holy grail point? Because we've heard your point of contention is during one particular ending of Mass Effect 3, even with the extended cut DLC, which was meant to address the issues of a lot of fans, Shepard is still alive and he still has that single breath. Now, the level of his consciousness and how really quote-unquote alive he is is still very much up for debate. But in terms of other very strong sort of opinions, more than even opinions, substantiated evidence for the indoctrination theory claim, what can you provide? Well, uh, the first one that comes to mind, uh, I'll try to shorten it so it gives the gist of why it's Certainly. so important, is the fact that, uh, first and foremost, the star child's arguments, uh, the, the person that Shepard is talking to at the end of the game, uh, or being, rather, I should say being, because we don't know exactly what they are, but 
uh, their main arguments between him and all of the uh, Reapers, the main antagonists, is that they're doing it, they're doing what they're doing, all of the violence, in order to protect the organics from synthetic violence. It's kind of strange, but uh, the point is that Shepard actually proved them wrong at one point. Um, if you do a series of events, it's one possibility in the storyline to come about, but that having that one possibility immediately puts a hole through the main antagonist's arguments. Mm -hmm. And that is that it's necessary to protect them, but when Shepard already got uh, the guests, they're another organic race, or synthetic race, to work with the organics after they had just been uh, fighting with each other. And furthermore, the synthetics actually wanted the peace, whereas the organics were the ones causing the violence. Shepard actually manages to get them to work together and to stop the fighting, which was actually the argument between the main antagonists. So if this star child is an all being, or like a, not an all being, but an omniscient sort of understands everything that the Reapers understands, understands the embodiment of what they are, then why does he not understand that they're no longer needed since Shepard just proved their main point wrong? And that is sort of playing into the idea that because their idea is wrong, it just means that they're lying to Shepard. And because they're lying to Shepard, you can assume that it's just this whole ending as a whole is a big lie trying to get Shepard to feed off of their ideas. Absolutely. Now, specifically to that uh, narrative incident, I'm just based on the changes that were made in the Extended Cut DLC, I feel that a little bit of what you're talking about has been addressed when you do speak to the Star Child. He references the fact that Shepard has made changes, that there is a paradigm shift, and essentially that is the motivation for allowing Shepard to have these different series of endings. Based on that information of when he expresses that, uh, Star Child specifically, that this was a predetermined plan, but because Shepard is here and he's an organic and what he's done has changed that plan and there needs to be an alteration, doesn't that, in a way, kind of put holes into the idea that the Star Child doesn't, is completely non-conforming and doesn't change in any sort of way? Well, it does, but at the same time it doesn't mm -hmm. because he doesn't actually make that change until Shepard is physically in front of him. And you would think that if what the Star Child is saying is actually true, that he would have already called off the assault and kind of ushered in somebody to try and make this change or this decision, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be Shepard or Anderson or Admiral Hackett, whoever. But it's not until Shepard actually gets there that the Star Child decides, oh, well, now since you're here, let's just change everything that we've been going through this entire time since you actually physically made it here. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's kind of... It brings up the question of why now? What, what exactly did Shepard do that ushered in this new change? And furthermore, when the Star Child is still talking, it's almost as though he's still pushing that old agenda, hidden through all these metaphors he makes and hidden through all of these, kind of the way he tries to get Shepard to think about the different options. Mm -hmm. It appears as though he says, uh, at face value, he says, sure, these are all these different options, but at the same time, it's kind of like he's pushing the original one, which was just succumb to us and we'll keep the cycles going type of thing. Yeah, but my main point of referring to that is it's very much up for debate. It's not in the same way um, a piece of evidentiary um, information, like you have in many other segments of your documentary. Of course, yeah. Yeah, the just yeah that, that's more of what's been going on lately is because mm -hmm. you kind of need to make your own assumptions about it, which is kind of the whole the whole point of it, and you can look at every single piece of evidence in multiple ways, and it's definitely not as, uh, what would you say, it's not as confirmed, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. uh, as some other pieces of evidence, because it is kind of subjective and open to interpretation. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in terms of your own opinion of the narrative. But that by no means negates or proves either way. It's just questions like this kind of tie into my main point of what I'm asking here. Um, I'm just kind of looking at the possibility that a lot of these connections that you bring up very, very thoroughly and succinctly in your documentary, there is a strong possibility that almost every single one can be attributed to Bioware's ignorance and oversight as opposed to an overarching kind of magisterium of what they're trying to do and to trick you. It's a difficult sort of question, but to you, you've spent so much time on this. Do you acknowledge that that is a strong possibility? Oh, definitely. Mm -hmm. And honestly, at the, that's actually the way my mindset is at now, because in the first documentary, I was actually, like many other people, under the assumption that it was some big master plan. Mm -hmm. But now I've actually 
uh, since the release of this documentary, or rather even while I was working on it, my mindset, like you said, has sort of shifted to maybe this really is just one horrible writing piece. Mm -hmm. And the point now is an effort to try and get Bioware to realize that they can still fix this horrible writing piece if they adopt the indoctrination theory to give them a clean slate to rewrite it, but without actually having to erase what they've already done. Absolutely. Now, you kind of tied into it a little bit there. What is your opinion on the indoctrination theory now? Um, I still really like it. I still think, like I said, it's a great place for Bioware to pick up the pieces, uh, kind of mend relationships with the fans, uh, and possibly even produce more content, which would garner more satisfaction from the fans and more money for both EA and Bioware. So I think really using the indoctrination theory is a win-win situation for everybody. Now, something very unique in this documentary that wasn't really as prevalent in your first two, you take a very, very solid stance on your opinions of Bioware and subsequently the EA marketing plan. To summarize, and of course, correct me if I'm misquoting because I, I wouldn't want to do that, you lend the idea that Bioware and EA want there to be a misguided approach. They are deliberately either not telling us everything or not at the level in which they can. Now, just a question to you. Do you feel as if this kind of exposition hurts a little bit of your overall message, which is more asking questions? And whenever a documentary filmmaker has these sort of films, it's always a difficult line between letting your own opinion and biases shine through and just asking questions to try and find the truth. Of course, yeah, mm. I feel the same way about it. I mean, because this was the last documentary, I sort of wanted to shine my own okay, yeah. through towards the end. So the other two, like you said, I wanted to keep it as objective as possible, whereas this one, because the newer evidence is subjective and because I also wanted to throw in my two cents at the end, uh, that's more or less why I did it. But uh, to answer the original question, mm -hmm. I, it's, it's hard to say exactly what I would think Bioware and EA is doing with this. I certainly think that they are benefiting from all of this controversy, really, mm -hmm. uh, because it's keeping the name you know, floating around in the air. And uh, it will keep people buying this new DLC just to see whether or not they're going to have a new ending or to see what their approach is going to be about it. So, again, I, I like to try and separate my own ideas from the documentary, but at the same time, I did want to include them at the end of this one because as far as I know, uh, this will be the last one. All right, so that's, that's just kind of what I was uh, hinting on there, that this one has a lot more exposition, has a lot more of uh, Julian Clock, I would say, than the first two. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Kind of as a wrap-up here, is the Mass Effect indoctrination theory battle over, or is it just starting? Oh, that's a hard, that's really a hard decision. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think it's ever going to go away as long as Bioware keeps producing new content in terms of the Bioware, or in terms of the Mass Effect universe. I think every time they announce a new DLC, people are going to go wild with speculation. But ultimately, I think the uh, conversation about it is going to end if we don't hear anything specifically about uh, the indoctrination theory within the next, say, year. Mm -hmm. I think after that point, it's pretty safe to say that we were wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Now, what would, it, sorry, what would it take, essentially, because you mentioned it there, if there's nothing being said, if someone from Bioware comes out, whether it's um, the community managers, not necessarily from the head, but someone who deals with public relations, if they come out and deliberately say indoctrination theory is not accurate, is that taken as purely information, or are some segments of the fan base going to kind of suggest that maybe they're up to something else? Well, I, again, that's something that everybody would need to kind of decide on their own. For you, Julian, what would be your position? For me. Yeah. It depends on how they would say it, like mm -hmm. how they would word it. I mean, you can tell how somebody words something, whether or not there's more to it or not. But if they flat out adamantly said that the indoctrination theory is wrong, I would believe them, mm -hmm. because... There's too much to be gained by uh, using it and too much to be lost by outright denying it. So I think if they're willing to outright deny it, adamantly deny it with no suggestive parts of the uh, statement, you know what I mean? Yeah, PR speak, so to speak, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, then I would be completely willing to believe that, yes, it's fake. So it depends on how they say it and it depends on the context, really. But Now, you spent hundreds of hours, I imagine, making these sort of documentaries. They're hours long in and of themselves. They're exhaustively researched. 
excellent, excellent pieces of uh, documentary film to actually watch. What's next now for Clever Noob, for Julian Cluck, and what can viewers look forward to? Well, I'm definitely going to be bringing us back to the roots. I think I actually said this back at the end of the first conversation we had after the first documentary. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm going to be going back to our roots, which is walkthroughs and uh, Let's Plays. Uh, there might be other special general features like the documentary. It was completely separate from what we usually do, mm -hmm. but it was a special feature. There may be more of those types of special features, but it all depends on what the fans are going to ask for and what they would like to see. So I'd like to cater to that in addition to just going back to uh, what we usually do. All right, and lastly, anything else you'd like to say to the fans? Uh, thank you for supporting it. Thank you for watching, even if you don't support it, and it's been fun. Thanks again to Julian Cluck, filmmaker behind the Indoctrination Theory ser documentary series and the man behind CleverNoob.com. All the information we talked about in this video can be found in the description, including contact information. Now, if you do want to ask Julian anything, you have any questions for him, you can contact him over YouTube on his website and, of course, in the forums of CleverNoob.com. Thank you so much for coming on to talk to us again, Julian. I'm Andy Burkowski for Video Game Sophistry.